Hello ladies and gentlemen, Chicos Chicas recap from round four is incoming. Uh, once again, focusing on the decisive games, kicking off proceedings with the game between Nepo and Vidit. Um, the game featured a Berlin, Berlin defense. Uh, and um, quite surprisingly, this was the game that brought all the... Well, I wouldn't want to say the entertainment, but all the decisive features. Uh, but let's get... Let's not get out of ahead of ourselves a main line Berlin. Now, this is not something that uh, we have seen for a fair while on top level chess because the players who play the Rui Lopez nowadays with white who would like to fight for a win, they tend to avoid the Berlin and play the anti-Berlin D3 uh, setups. But Nepo decided that this was time to re-enter discussions um, about the Berlin. And uh, at this point, I'm exiting discussions because my knowledge of the Berlin is extremely limited and 98% of it comes from about 25 years ago when I analyzed it with my coach, international master, Laszlo Hazai. Uh, well, of course, I'm not exiting discussions. I will try to put in my two cents here and there. But uh, yeah, once again, the Berlin is a very, very tough battleground and it's not so easy to understand what's going on. We have been following theory all the way up to here. And what's really curious here is, is that knight h2 here is the engine, engine stop move, offering us a whopping 0.11 advantage, although it keeps on bouncing up and down, so basically bugger all. But what's also interesting is the fact that knight h2 is about the fifth or sixth most popular move on Grandmaster, top Grandmaster level. So this is by no means the go-to move. Now, what's happening here? What's happening here is, is that white enjoys a very important four versus three pawn majority on the king side, just like in the exchange Rui Lopez, by the way. And this is basically the backbone of our strategy and plans. What we wanna do here is to get F4 in. If this pawn was on f4, white would have almost everything we can dream for in the um, Berlin, which is a fluid pawn formation that can easily roll on. And knight h2 is exactly trying to accomplish this, to get the pawn to f4, then play bishop e3, knight f3, rook d1, develop and start rolling up with those pawns. What's particularly interesting about this is, is that one of Black's best responses is to completely ignore and allow this to happen. We did play the extremely thematic G5. Every man and his dog would play G5 here who understands the concepts that I just uh, explained to you earlier. Because of course it completely messes with F4 since now F4 takes would split white pawns apart. Granted it splits the black pawns apart too, but pawn H5 is a big part of Black's plans anyway. And so that's no biggie. But let me show you this. Turns out, after c5, f4, knight c6, know that now black is potentially threatening to jump around here and there. Bishop e3, b6, rook d1, king c8, and knight f3, we just arrived at the position that I described as the ultimate white dream, only to be bitterly disappointed, because here comes h5, very typical and known concept, and you would think that, ah, no worries, f5 is gonna fix it. No. Nah. Here comes takes, takes, and it turns out that although we have achieved the dream pawn formation, this pawn formation is also unfortunately overextended, and after g6, we cannot retain this marvelous pawn fortress in the center slash king side, and um, yeah, in fact, here we are battling to um, you know, at least stay on even terms with black. Turns out our best chance to continue the game is to actually sack an exchange and go for this domination uh, on the king side with pawn f6. The only downside to this scenario, it would actually be really good if we could play just one more move, king g2, but we cannot, which means rook h3 is coming. And after king g2, the counter exchange sack shatters all hopes and uh, it is only black who can dream about a win. So, turns out that knight h2 even struggles against the standard moves, let alone the one that directly stops f4. 
f4 was played. Takes, bishop takes, bishop e6. And now we play a fair few very logical centralizing and developing moves, which I will not really commentate because they just seem to make a lot of sense to, I suppose, everyone who has at least seen one Berlin game. Black usually clears the king out to the queen side. Doesn't worry too much about the location of these pieces. And generally speaking, some form of queenside pawn advance happens like a5, c5 in order to at least threaten with some sort of pawn progression on the queen side. Now we are getting to the point, the end of the stick very, very soon. Bishop e7 and Nepo here played knight h4. Um, very, very logical stuff. The engine prefers the idea or mentions the idea of h4 with the concept of h5 fixing the pawn on um, h6. I found a very interesting line here too. h5, knight c4, rook f2 b5 and uh, it seems that black comes on time with b4 and so we seem to be able to break the position with g5 eventually but b4 on the other wing appears to be really really difficult to meet and it seems that black's counterplay is is on time and if the position explodes the two bishops will become absolutely vicious so this could have been a potential path to for the game to follow. Instead, we went with knight h4, h5, and g5. And here the idea of g6 is becoming quite pressing. At this point, I would like to highlight something that I have been doing lately in the, the recaps, the time discrepancy. Nepo is traditionally known to be a very fast player, but nonetheless, the gap here is telling a story. Um, Rook a5 played, and I would like to mention that although objectively speaking there is absolutely nothing wrong with this move, that rook maneuver that begins with rook a5 is going to be uh, the decisive factor of this game. Rook e1, rook b5, bishop c1, retreating the bishop to cover the pawn, opening up the files, white is ready to strike with g6, and here Vidit plays rook b3, potentially the first mistake in the game. There is an absolutely breathtaking line here, which I think Vidit may have missed, which is c4, reopening the fifth rank for the rock. It seems to blunder into g6, but the fact of the matter is, is that first and foremost, after take stakes, black is totally fine even after rook d8, but better still, after g6, black has knight takes e5. A surprising exchange sack, g7, hello rook, bishop takes f6. And after takes, bishop takes, believe it or not, black is an exchange down for a pawn. The engine's evaluation is almost minus three, meaning black is a piece up. And the reason for this is the incoming knight d3 threat, which is going to hurt the pawns very, very badly. Additionally to that, the king is very exposed to, to various dirty checks, including bishop e5 after knight d3. I think this may have been missed on Vidit's end. He played rook b3. Kind of a vague idea. I suppose he wanted to exploit this pin with an occasional knight d4. g6 came, very logical, takes, takes. And this is potentially the second mistake back to back rook d8. Instead, h4 was particularly interesting. Because after knight takes pawn c4, we find ourselves in a scenario which is not very often seen in a game of chess, where all of our pieces look pretty okay, but almost none of them can move. Check that out. Bishop can't move because the pawn is hanging on b2. This knight can't move because his buddy is hanging behind it. And his buddy can't move because h3 is hanging. And all of a sudden, you go like, okay, I have an extra pawn on h3, but what do I do? I don't have a move left. And black does, by the way. Black is threatening rook b5 and picking off e5. So if anything, uh, white needs to be careful here. I'm surprised that this wasn't played. And after rook d8 now, this is becoming a steady downhill. Uh, knight h5. Rook d3, rook f3, swap, 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 and pawn e6. And now the story of the game 
is the power of this e6 piece, pawn rather, excuse me, which will have to be ultimately, uh, black will have to sacrifice a piece for is what I'm trying to say, but finding the right time in the right circumstances proved to be uh, too much of a task for Vidit, who played b5, best move, bishop g5, kicking the knight, knight d5, e7. Now, this is the point where I think uh, black missed what appeared to me to be a reasonably logical scenario for a draw, and that was um, bishop c6. And the engine gives here a line, king g3, knight b6, knight g7, and I don't really get this. Like, this to me doesn't look like uh, white is anywhere near winning, but let me show you another even more confusing variation. So game went bishop d7, stopping queening, rook d1, very logical, king c6, king e4, and bishop e8, the losing move. Now, after king e4, for the life of me, I could not find um, a reasonable attempt to win this with white. And I kept on playing out the engine's moves. The engine gives about 1.3, and I'm playing engine moves, yeah? And I'm not seeing where the winning plan is. Like, these are all best engine moves. Obviously, by the way, the idea is to come to d7 with the knight to hunt the pawn, right? So we're chasing the bishop. Now, knight d7 is ready to go, but the pesky checks don't run out. Or the pesky attacks, even. And white has to be very careful because, tada, a midboard mate like this would cost a piece. So they have to go to f7, and I, I just don't get it. I stopped here. Engine still insists on 1.4. I, I don't see it. Like, if this does win for white, this requires impeccable technique and probably some extremely deep ideas. Very, very deep stuff. I think this was... Um, yeah, Bishop E8 was a, a tragic blunder by Vidit. What I would like to point out to you here is, is that the method of white, white's winning plan slash peace coordination is so utterly counterintuitive that I think that's what must have messed with it, with its head too. Because what I mean by counterintuitive is, is that having opposite colored bishops means that black does have a lot of control very firm and meaningful control of the light squares. And so the general strategy in such cases is that you try to dodge it by putting as many pieces on dark squares as you can to kind of try to neutralize the bishop. And instead, the winning procedure is nothing but putting almost everything we have continuously on white squares. And bishop e8, trying, by the way, to hurt white on the light squares, continues that trend. But it's too late. You can actually line up king rook with a light square bishop on the board and then continue to leave them on due to various tactical ideas, such as, obviously, the pawn promotion. But nonetheless, it just feels so alien and odd to a human player to allow this whole white squared lineup. And I think it doesn't even end there. By the way, note here this brilliant bishop c1. That also potentially may be the move that Vidit missed, because now the rook on b3 is tragically excluded from the game. And actually, it's never going to return. So now, virtually, white is playing a rook up. Bishop g6 check was played, king e5 was played, b4 is played, trying to somehow... Uh, break out with the rock, but black is too late to the party. Here comes the dagger thrust that decides the game. King f6, double x clam, hitting the bishop. And it turns out that the diagonal for the bishop is too short. Bishop e8 played, rook d8, and the game is over. If the bishop goes to h5 after rook h8, we manage to eliminate all squares on the diagonal. The bishop has to go, allowing a white promotion. Whereas after um, bishop d, sorry, takes uh, takes back bishop d7, we have yet another king move onto the light squares, and now rook d7, e6, uh, e8 rather, is uh, unstoppable. Nepo took d7, 
and uh, after the check king e6 was the end of the story because there is no more checks and the pawn is going to promote now the entombment of this rock on b3 was definitely a beautiful touch almost study like and that actually made me uh think about something that i would like to show you and introduce you to uh there is this lovely gentleman who is a chess composing grandmaster called stefan slumstrap nielsen uh, you can find him on Twitter, where he regularly posts his uh, absolutely amazing studies. And he has been composing studies, not puzzles. Please, please get that right. I have a separate video on this channel for the differences. He has been composing studies based on the games that have been played uh, in the candidates. And I will show you one of his compositions, which he posted a, while, uh, a couple of hours ago, maybe a day ago. This is based, obviously, on the Pragnananda Knight H6 uh, Perpetual Check idea, which uh, you can see in my round to recap, by the way. And this is a wide to move and draw study based on the very concept of the Pragnananda Perpetual. White, uh, the White King is in check, and the solution runs like this. You need to go King D1, and when the Queen captures the Bishop, we have check, King G8, and check. This is the core idea. That was the concept borrowed from uh, the game. Note that King F8 even loses to Queen F3, Queen A8, and it's going to be a back rank mate. So there is no point for Black to do the two and throw. They have to accept their fate and take the pawn. And now comes the check. Now King F8 still gets mated. So they have to go to H8. And there comes the very clever finish, which is obviously a very different story from the Pragnan and the game. But nonetheless, you get the... Point, queen c3 check and after queen takes c3 the game is over because it's a stalemate white has managed to escape uh beautiful stuff now he also composed one based on the first round loss of late in j and that is nothing short of sensational uh i very highly recommend you to to check him out i will put his name and his twitter link um in the description below and with that we're going to move on to the second game of the day that i wanted to discuss with you today guys which was none other than um salimova against uh, koneru um and the bulgarian uh put on some remarkable show but before we get there i must say that i was very impressed with koneru's approach to this game she went for this less trodden path with 94 f5 and very clearly she just decided to throw in the kitchen and uh, the kitchen sink going h5 as early as move nine and uh hats off for that especially because koneru is more known for a classical positional style player so for her to go full Monty uh, with h5 that's very very impressive uh, also very impressive by the way is the fact how well Salimova handled Salimova handled the opening perfect moves all the way take take queen d7 a very odd deployment of the queen but in fact best move rook c1 pretend preventing uh, rather protecting the knight on c3 allowing d5 and queen f7 this is where Koneru made a misstep. Um, two very exciting variations were um, available for her at this point. One was b6, with the simple idea of bishop b7 and castle. Um, and I quite like this. So something like f3, take, 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 bishop b7 um, looks really good for black. And then castles in this black, uh, excuse me, this white king is definitely uh, more exposed than its counterpart on the c8. The other one that I really, really liked for Blackie was G5, with the idea of a complete um, grip and bind on White's position with G4, but also allowing the Queen to go across to H7. However, after F3 takes, Queen takes comes the hardest move of this idea, which is that we do not go to H7 anymore, because it makes no sense, since Queen check, King H2 would only help White to conquer the h file and hurt black instead queen g7 is the genius idea suggesting certain knight d4 
sacrificial ideas, as well as g5 and if queen f4, bishop g5. For example, here, um, after king f2, g4, king and queen e2, knight d4, we can already put the pieces back in the box, more or less, um, because black is, yeah, coming at us like mad. Unfortunately, uh, Conan here went for queen f7, which is a bit of a half measure, really, at the best of times, because she doesn't really want to play queen h5 to trade queens, but then the only purpose of the move was to allow bishop d7 castles, but then b6, bishop b7 would have been a heap healthier. From here on out, uh, Salimova puts on an absolute masterclass. Perfect moves all the way. And it turns out that very, very soon, we are going to find that it is actually the black king who is now more vulnerable than the white one. And this was the very moment when Koneru needed to realize that the trend was shifting away from her. And here, a queen trade would have been perfectly timely in order to go into something like this, where although white's position is definitely more attractive uh, because of uh, the ultimate d5 break, is going to cause severe distress in the black army. But nonetheless, material is level. There are no apparent pawn weaknesses in black's camp. This, I think, should have been holdable. Instead, um, Conner opted for g4 here, and black's position fell apart very, very suddenly. Now the pin and the loose pawns and the slightly disjointed minor pieces all came together to an evaluation which meant that, yeah, at this point, queen a5 is the only way to stay alive to trade queens, and that's plus two. Everything else is like we're getting absolutely murdered here on the king side. Knight is coming in with the tempo. Often, rook takes ideas win more than an exchange or more than two pieces for the rook. So, yeah, queen a5 had to be played, and... Um, I'm actually going to blitz through the rest because um, it was just a very, very pure, clean conversion. Extra pawn, still a weakness, still pieces all over the shop. Uh, and yeah, White just uh, absolutely went on to mow down the board and uh, ended up winning this endgame with ease, which actually creates a unique situation as far as my predictions are concerned because Nepo, whom I predicted as one of the most likely winners of the men's is now in the lead by half a point and um i would be surprised if he did not end up at the very top whereas i predicted conero doing well amongst the ladies but this defeat is now definitely uh throwing a major major spanner in the works for her uh in her hopes to become a challenger there is still a lot left of this tournament so we will see but um yeah for now, it does look like, at least for the gents, that uh, Nepo is uh, going to uh, probably carve out another World Championship final. That was it for me from uh, for now, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for tuning in and watching my recaps. I'm going to be back with the next soon. Thank you. Bye.